A voice is ever at thy side, speaking in tones of might, like the prophetic voice that cried to John in Patmos, write, write and tell out this bloody tale, record this dire eclipse, this day of wrath, this endless wail, this dread apocalypse. Ah, distinctly I remember when first I heard Longfellow's commanding exhortation, some 64 and a plus years ago. I was two years old, sitting attentively in my crib, as my father read the lines of this most beloved of the fireside poets. Write, write. Immediately I was seized with the furor scribendi, the rage for writing. So with forced fingers rude before the mellowing year, I ardently grasped my crusty crayon, crayon and with passion I did write. Okay, in truth, I scribbled and scribbled and scribbled as my dear mother, God rest her soul, would gladly attest if she were here today. I scribbled on my crib, I scribbled on the wall, I scribbled on the floor, and occasionally I scribbled on paper. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I did not admittedly write in my earliest scribblings about the dire eclipse and the dread apocalypse. It was probably something a bit more mundane. However, an incorrigible scribbler had been unleashed upon the world, <laughs> an unsuspecting world. And for better or worse, I've been scribbling ever since. And yes, as many of you no doubt suspect, I still scribble all of my articles with crayons. <laughs> Gary Benoit doesn't know that yet. And now I can see the concern on some faces out there, particularly Ray and Carol Clark and other natureful souls. So to set everyone at ease, let me assure one and all that I use only non-toxic, non-GMO, gluten-free, organic, all-natural, free-range crayons. <laughs> but in order to keep within our very strict 25 minutes, I'm going to race read this at double talk, double speed, from a script I have timed precisely, and that of course I have scribbled out in crayon. My main serious scribbling began in 1975, following my graduation from college and joining the John Birch Society. In 1976, I joined the, JPS, the JBS staff. At that time, the Society had an office in San Marino, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. So I packed my meager belongings, said goodbye to my family, and left my native Idaho for Planet California. It was quite a culture shock for a backwoods country boy from the mountains of the Gem State. I encountered much in my new exotic environment that was fascinating, and a great deal that was truly alarming. One of the most alarming things I discovered was, as a recently woke bircher, was the incredible level of communist activity all over Southern California, from the streets to the suites. While taking graduate classes at Cal State LA, I found communist organizations operating openly on and around the campus. The Communist Party USA, the Maoist Revolutionary Communist Party, the Communist Front National Lawyers Guild, the Communist founded ACLU, and many others. I began attending meetings of these and other groups, including organizations that were fronts and support groups for terrorists, such as the PLO, the Sandinistas, the Farabundo Marti, and the Weather Underground. What was most alarming to me was the large number of public officials at these meetings, judges, prosecutors, public defenders, city councilmen, county commissioners, and their staffs who were involved with these organizations. And of course, there were professors and Hollywood celebrities. I began working about the same time with Congressman Larry McDonald, whose Western Goals Foundation was putting together a national security database on subversive organizations and individuals. I cataloged the activities of the groups I was monitoring, and when appropriate, 
due to national security concerns, which was often, I shared that information with the Los Angeles Police Department Intelligence Division and the FBI, as well as JBS and Western Goals. Because of this relationship, I was the only journalist allowed to attend the security conference of the top police and intelligence agencies for the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. I was a primary researcher for Western Goal's documentary, No Place to Hide, The Strategy and Tactics of Terrorism. It was shown on national television, on CNN of all places. But that was before CNN stood for communists and nattering nabobs. <laughs> Dr. Larry McDonald, of course, was also chairman of the John Birch Society. There's supposed to be a slide in there of him, but it disappeared. Uh, he was chairman of the John Birch Society, but only for a short time before he was infamously shot down by a Soviet fighter jet while he was aboard a civilian Korean Airlines flight, 007, on September 1, 1983. I will always be grateful to Congressman McDonald for all his heroic defense of America, his opposition to communist tyranny and subversion, and for giving me the privilege of working with him. I'm also grateful to editor Scott Stanley, who gave me the opportunity to write for the Review of the News and American Opinion, the forerunners of the New American Magazine. Along those lines, I'm also indebted to Gary Allen, Alan Stang, Hilaire de Berrier, and our other writers for whom I did research and who pointed the way for me as an investigative reporter. <clears throat> and since he is with us here today, I really must recognize my dear friend, mentor, and colleague who signed my JBS membership application and with whom I worked closely at the San Marino office where he served for many years. Many of you know him. Uh, he was national director of the JBS Speakers Bureau, our summer youth camps, support your local police, trim, and the Larry McDonald Crusade. Joe Merton. Joe, where are you? There he is, they're back there, thank you. I am indebted especially to the New Americans editor, Gary Benoit, and publisher, Jack McManus, for standing behind me and supporting me over the decades, especially when it involved particularly politically risky and long-term investigations, such as the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. Most particularly, though, I am grateful to you, all you stalwart patriots, members of the John Birch Society, for putting boots on the ground and disseminating the information, the articles, the books, the videos that we produced. Without that, we would have been unheard symbols clanging in the void controlled by the globalist media. Thanks to all of you, this humble scribbler has been privileged to participate up close to investigate and record some of the most momentous events of our lifetimes. I have been able to meet and interview some of the great statesmen, scientists, philosophers, economists, military leaders, Medal of Honor recipients, even movie stars, as well as some of the perfidious villains, including spies, terrorists, and dictators. I do know that we have made a difference, a big difference in the arc of the history of our times, a difference far greater than shown by circulation and sales numbers. In the brief time we have here, I will only be able to scratch the surface of some of the articles related to the society's efforts that have played a role in our ongoing crusade to assure that freedom shall not perish. You see here the cover of the New American Magazine with Tom Sanko Linda. Many of you no doubt re recall Mayor Linda. He is the incredibly courageous mayor of Ibahi Township who steadfastly resisted the terrorist ANC in South Africa, even as many of his colleagues were hideously tortured, necklaced, and murdered. And even after his own home had been firebombed and burned to the ground, he and his family became hunted fugitives. They were marked for death, but he could not be cowed or silenced. He went on a speaking tour for the JBS to challenge Nelson Mandela's hoodlums and tell the American people the bloody tale about what was really happening in South Africa. I was privilege to travel with him on his tour and become a good friend of him. In the extraordinary and ultimately tragic saga of Elian Gonzalez, readers of the New American had a front row seat. Due to the trust we had built, we had an exclusive entree and access to Elian's extended family and the leaders of the Miami Cuban community. 
While American po politicians and media pundits were singing the praises of Soviet dictators Brezhnev and Gorbachev, we were telling the truth about the reality of the Soviet Union via witnesses such as Avraham Shifrin, a survivor of the horrendous Gulag prison system. And speaking of Gor Gorbachev, the New American was the only media organization outside of the fake news media to attend and report on Mikhail Gorbachev's State of the World forums in New York City and San Francisco. In 2008, I, I went to former captive nations of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. In Vilnius, Lithuania, I covered the World Conference on Victims of Communism. Survivors and escapees from all over the communist world gave riveting testimony. It should have been front page news everywhere. But of course, the fake news media had more important news to cover, undoubtedly concerning the latest episodes of Hollywood bed hopping. My driver throughout my stay there was Edvardus Brokis, whom you see here. Who would guess that this cherubic looking, perpetually smiling man was a survivor of Verkuta, 100 miles above the Arctic Circle, one of the most brutal Siberian death camps of the notorious Soviet Gulag. Edvardus took me to, a former K to the former KGB headquarters in Vilnius, Lithuania, and posed for me behind the very cells where he was imprisoned and tortured before being sent to Vorkuta. The Washington Post has a new slogan, the story must be told. But as you probably guessed, they're not interested in the stories of Edvardus Barokas or any of the millions of other victims of communism like him. Dr. Hang Noor was a Cambodian physician who went through harrowing experiences to escape communist Khmer Rouge genocide in his country. He won an Academy Award for his portrayal, first time he'd ever acted, for his portrayal of Dith Pran in the movie about the genocide called The Killing Fields. I interviewed him and was investigating charges by him and other Cambodians in Los Angeles who said Khmer Rouge assassins had been sent here to kill him and other Cambodians who were speaking out. He was murdered, I believe assassinated, by those very assassins he warned about here in the United States of America in Los Angeles. But in the official version, his death was written off as a murder robbery, even though nothing was taken, including his wallet, cash, ring, expensive Rolex watch, and a car. We're still investigating now. In 1990, the New American covered the historic change of government in Nicaragua as President Violeta Chamorro was inaugurated to replace the communist regime led by the Ortega brothers and their Sandinista comrades. Thanks to the Nicaraguan leaders I befriended in California <clears throat> and traveled with in Nicaragua, the New American was given exclusive access to Violeta Chamorro, including exclusive admission to her pre-inaugural meeting of her cabinet in her home. The New American's investigation of the bombing of the Edward P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City was the biggest, longest, costliest investigation ever for our organization. In dozens of articles spanning several years, we exposed numerous lies and cover-ups in the official Clinton administration version of the event as it was peddled by the controlled media. One of the first lies to fall to countervailing facts was the claim that Timothy McVeigh had blown up the building with an ammonium nitrate bomb placed in a rental truck parked next to the building. One of the world's top explosive experts, probably the top, General Benton K. Parton, became one of our key witnesses, showing that scenario was impossible and demonstrating that additional explosive devices were placed on the building's structural columns. We soon had additional world-renowned experts endorsing this, this thesis, such as nuclear physicist, physicist Dr. Sam Cohen, father of the neutron bomb and member of the Manhattan Project atom bomb team. Ergo, there had to have been multiple conspirators and the Clinton administration's lone bomber scenario was thoroughly trashed and they knew it. 172 souls perished in that terrorist blast. The usual number given is 169, but that is because the adamantly pro-abortion media refused to count the lives 
of the three unborn children of the preg three pregnant women who were killed. But regardless of the numbers, the statistics used, 168, 169, or 172, these are real people <clears throat> represented by the statistics, and they left behind shattered families and communities. Because we had built trust with our reporting, the New American was able to get unique access to survivors, victims' families, first responders, eyewitnesses, official documents, photographs, and much more that appeared nowhere else. One of the most steadfast, courageous, and helpful of the many family members I met and interviewed was Mrs. Janie Coverdale, seen here with photographs of her grandsons, Aaron and Elijah, both of whom were killed in the bombing. Among the many path-breaking stories we published were these, showing that certain federal agencies had advanced warning that the bombing was going to occur and their employees didn't show up for work that morning. Then was, there, there was the whole huge issue of German national Andreas Strassmeier, this man you see here on the left next to Timothy McVeigh. He was connected not only to McVeigh, as you remember, but also to the rural compound known as Elohim City, where KKK white Aryan resistance leader Dennis Mahon and other notorious agent provocateurs, operatives of the federal government, operated out of. Then there was the issue of John Doe number two, the man that multiple witnesses connected as an accomplice of McVeigh and that the Department of Justice uh, released a, a picture on, and that the Clinton administration later tried to claim never existed. We covered all of those and much, much more. Carol Howe, an undercover operative for the ATF, provided an enormous amount of damning evidence, including the ATF and FBI were covering up evidence about the involvement in the bombing of Strassmeyer, Mahon, and others. While ABC, CBS, NBC, and other media giants were scrambling to find and interview her, Carol Howe gave The New American an exclusive interview. And we also posted online dozens of pages of her ATF and FBI documents that corroborated her stories. In the center photo, you see the book cover of The Secret Life of Bill Clinton, and below it, a photo of the author, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who was then uh, the Washington, D.C. bureau chief for the British Sunday Telegraph. I'm extremely grateful to him for giving our OKC efforts at TNA a much wider audience. Prior to that, I had been largely unsuccessful in trying to get other conservative publications to join us in this huge undertaking. Some of these friends, came straight out and told me, we love what you're doing, it's tremendous work, we're afraid to get involved. They knew the Clinton administration and what it was capable of. Fortunately, Ambrose did not allow that to deter him, although afterwards, as a result of his reporting on this, he was forced to transfer under State Department pressure uh, to the, uh, Brussels to cover the European Union. <clears throat> We can't even begin to scratch the surface of those who should be honored for their incredible contributions to this effort. Among those whom we should recognize are Rep State Representative Charles Key, who stood virtually alone as a public official and refused to knuckle under to the media and political attacks. Glenn and Kathy Wilburn, like Janie Coverdale, lost two grandsons, Chase and Colton, and they were unrelenting researchers for the truth and what really happened and, and why. Not shown are two people <clears throat> without whom are many OKC, without whom many of our OKC stories could not have come about. <clears throat> our Oklahoma City Council member George Wallace and his lovely wife Nancy, are you here? George, I know you're here. Oh, right here. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Not only did they pick me up many times at the airport, chauffeur me around, uh, lend me their vehicles, host me in their homes, sometimes for weeks, uh, feed me, allow me to turn their home into my office, but George frequently accompanied me to clandestine meetings <clears throat> with survivors, witnesses, law enforcement, and uh, and he, then he personally developed many of the leads in the case. Their assistance was priceless, as was that of Tulsa JBS physician Mike Ritz and Oklahoma Council Member Clark Curry. Where are you, Clark? Uh, you know, uh, th that was just, uh, their, their help was uh, outstanding. And it's an example of the amazing help and the level of commitment 
I have experienced from dedicated birchers all over the country on so many of the stories I have covered over the decades. We don't have the deep pockets and the massive personnel teams of the fake news media, but we have something in our faithful members they can't touch. For over 30 years, I was a, an officially accredited reporter at the United Nations in New York City and at UN conferences around the world. In 1990, I attended the UN Convention on the Rights, the UN Children's Summit, which was a huge promotional effort for the so-called UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which in truth was and is a vicious attack on parental rights and a communist effort to make children property of the state. I'm sure our friends from Poland here know all about that. This is one of the many articles that we published on this issue, and it is largely due to JBS efforts, you utilizing this information, uh, that the United States remains the only country in the world that has not ratified this fraudulent, dangerous pact. And you deserve, and you deserve a major pat on the back from not only your fellow citizens, but from children still unborn whom you have helped to protect. One of the biggest and most important UN events we ever covered was the original 1992 UN Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. The New American was the only conservative, constitutionalist, Americanist news organization. There were over 30,000 so-called journalists there. We were the only conservative one reporting on what was really happening there. This was the, the confab that gave us Agenda 21, the Global Warming Treaty, the Biodiversity Treaty, the Declaration of Foreign, uh, Forest Principles, and ultimately the Earth Charter, and our good buddy Al Gore. When the UN launched its effort to, to establish the International Criminal Court, the ICC, in 1995, we again stood virtually alone. We exposed it, its dangers to American liberty, sovereignty, and the rule of law. By 1998, when the UN held its ICC conference in Rome, which we covered, a few other groups had joined us, most notably Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum. But thanks to your efforts, the US remains the major holdout with both Republican and Democratic administrations failing to win Senate report, approval of the treaty. May that continue. Of course, there's much more, such as the Law of the Sea Treaty, the UN Small Arms Treaty, the UN Population Control and Abortion Efforts, UN Perversion adjust, Agenda Promoting Homosexuality and pro Promiscuity, UN Global Tax Efforts, the UN Grab for Control of the Internet, and much much more. As we point out in this issue of TNA, the UN is already on the brink of becoming a world government, and it is certain that the one world has already would have achieved that goal if not for the unwavering opposition to these schemes that you wonderful patriots have provided over the decades. Most Americans had not begun paying much attention to the European Union until the massive migration crisis of 2011, which flooded Europe with over a million so-called refugees from Muslim countries. That crisis played a big role the following year in the historic Brexit, in which British voters chose to leave the EU. However, readers of The New American knew decades ahead of even the best informed citizens of the UK and the EU that the EU was rotten from the start. In the 1980s, we were providing them with a factual historical background on the globalist actors of the Council on Foreign Relations who had devised this regional scheme as a stepping stone to world government. I wrote many of those articles, but I would not have been able to do so without the tutelage of, <clears throat> of Hilaire de Berrier, a longtime contributing editor to American Opinion and The New American, and the publisher of the authoritative intelligence newsletter, h to b Reports. Besides being a top expert on the EU and many other topics, and an important mentor to me, he was a friend and advisor to Robert Welch, Larry McDonald, as well as many of you. I had a number of extended stays with him at his apartment in Monte Carlo, Monaco, where I studied his files. I traveled with him to the EU headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, and stayed with him at his apartment there. He willed me his incomparable uh, library and files. Immigration out of control, the immigration invasion. 
Uh, that was the video that we produced in 1988, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, in articles and videos, we were warning the American people. Finally, just in the past decade and in the last couple of years, it was made into a reality as people caught on and as Donald Trump was able to use that education that we had built uh, to, to use that as one of his signature features that helped him win the election. As I said, the Washington Post tells us the story must be told. One of their other slogans is democracy dies in darkness. Well, hilariously, the New York Times has also come up with a competing tagline. Truth is more important now than ever. <laughs> their audacity and hypocrisy is astonishing. These are the organs of the deep state that for a century have epitomized darkness, that have spiked the real stories that must be told, and that have crushed truth and crucified truth tellers. But in the immortal lines of Whittier, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Thank you, and God bless you, God bless America, and God bless the John Birch Society. <laughs>